G'day, I'm Paul. Today is a special day. No, it's not because that's a 911 GT3 and this is a closed privy ground. It is because this is a 911 GT3 that you could only buy in Australia. So it is called the 911 GT3 Touring 70th Anniversary, and it's here to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the first Porsche to arrive in Australia. And because the first Porsche to arrive in Australia was a 356, this kind of mimics a lot of those design elements, including this paint, which is called Fish Silver Grey Metallic. You see the inside's got similar highlights as well. So look, it's a really special car in that regard. The other thing as well is this car has been brought to Australia for a bit of promo stuff, and then it's gonna disappear back to Porsche's museum once we're done with it. So, see ya. <laughs> uh, this is priced at just under $500,000 before you add any options. But if that's too expensive, the entire 911 range kicks off at under 250 grand. Now this is kind of unique because it doesn't really have a great deal of competitors, but if I was to call some out, it'd be stuff like the Nissan GTR Nismo and stuff like the Mercedes AMG GTR. You've got other cars around the place, but they're the two, I guess, main competitors to it. Today, we're gonna to do a detailed review of this car. So if you do wanna skip ahead to other parts of the review, you can use the time codes on the screen, or if you're on YouTube, you can scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you do wanna help us grow and support us, make sure you subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon, because that's gonna tell you every single time we drive these very special, unique, limited editions. Let's talk about the exterior. So I mentioned before, only one color is available. Fish silver grey metallic, it mimics that first Porsche that arrived in Australia. In terms of the rest of the design, the GT3, if you don't know exactly what it is, it's basically a race car for the road. It literally has an engine out of a race car and it shares the same part numbers and everything. So it is pretty unique in the sense that this is a vehicle you can take to the racetrack, flog the absolute bejesus out of, and then drive home. It is the complete package when it comes to that type of thing. And in terms of design changes, the GT3 has these scoops here on the bonnet for cooling. Down the bottom here, you've got more cooling and then quite an aggressive front lip. This will obviously catch on literally every driveway you've ever been in. So it does have a front lifter. You flick a button and then the front lifts up so you don't scrape this and do any damage to the vehicle as you're getting in and out of driveways. It's an incredible design and the Touring is different to the standard GT3 because the regular GT3 has an enormous wing on the back and it looks quite aggressive. The Touring is designed to give you the same performance potential but without all the aggressive sporty looking things on it. Over here you've got a set of full LED headlights. I love this quad spotlight design so when the car's driving along you can see that lighting up. And then in the centre there you have a powerful LED headlight with adaptive lighting as well. So it is a, a proper setup, you don't really have any compromises there at all. On the side there you've got an indicator. Now let's have a look at these wheels. So the car comes standard with a set of Pilot Sport Cup 2 tyres. You can get the Cup R on these as well. So that's the tyre they use to set the Nürburgring lap time. But in standard trim, this is the tyre that you're getting. It's a pretty aggressive tyre. So in the wet, it's not going to have a great deal of traction compared to a sporty tyre, but it is going to get you there. If you go to the Cup R, you've got basically no traction in the wet at all. It's a 20 inch rim at the front and then it goes to a 21 inch rim at the rear and they're big fat tires. So this is a 255 here and over 300 mil wide at the back. The brakes are enormous as well. So this is just a steel brake. You can get a carbon ceramic brake package as well. But this rotor here measures 408 millimeters, which is bigger than the previous generation of the GT3. And then in addition to that, you have six piston calipers at the front here, four piston at the rear. I love this center lock here. That just looks it just makes it, it completes that race car look and you can get this on other 911 models, but I think it's perfectly fitting here for the GT3 because it really just tells everyone that this is indeed a race car. This is where you fill the fuel on a 911, so it's not at the back there because that's where your engine is. So pretty cool setup there. And I'll run you through the boot as well because that is up the front here as well, not at the back. So on your wing mirror there, you have really nothing attached to that. This doesn't have a 360 camera. You don't have any indicator built into that. It is just built for aero, but you can tuck that in if you do have I don't know, a narrow park or something like that. You don't want anyone ripping your mirror off. Have a look at the height of it. So I'm 185 centimetres tall. Getting in and out of this is a little tricky for me, but um, yeah, it kind of gives you an, an impression of just how low this car is to the ground. The GT3 sits lower than a standard 911 too, thanks to that sport suspension. So it really does hug the road quite nicely. The 70th anniversary, in addition to the custom colours and some of the stuff I'll run you through on the interior, 
gets this badge on the side that reads 70 years Porsche Australia edition. There's also a sill plate inside the cabin that does the same thing. In addition to this, Porsche also has a custom cover for the key, so you get a leather cover for it, but the actual key is completed in the same color as the bodywork. And then have a look at this. When you do lock the 911, rub your finger on that, and then that tucks away. And then when you do want to unlock it, you just put your finger under there. So pretty cool setup. And it kind of, again, it's just one of those little aero things that will help you get every little bit of extra time you can out of the racetrack when you are going hard. Have a look at this. They are absolutely enormous. I love how imposing that looks and 315 millimeter wide at the rear. This is a properly big stance when you look at it as it comes around the back there. So come around to the rear of the car. I'll show you some of this stuff. Have a look at this. How good does this look? So I don't know, the GT3 looks out of this world with that huge wing, the adjustable wing they have on the back, but this really just gives it a whole nother character. And I think that if you don't want that boy racer look, the Touring really neatens it up nicely, but doesn't really compromise all that much in terms of performance. So you still know that it's a GT3 because they have GT3 Touring written here. This is your engine cover, so that pops open. You've got a little brake light in there as well. You can't really see much with the engine because yes, it is rear engine, but it's tucked away nicely. So if you're gonna be doing any work on this, it'll be going back to Porsche. I don't think you'll be touching any of that yourself. This spoiler comes out at speed. Behind here, you've got an LED light that looks fantastic at nighttime. Porsche writing just here and twin exhaust outlets plus a diffuser down the bottom there for the GT3. So it is such a good looking vehicle. I just, I don't know, I'm in love with it. Now, let me know what you think in the comments section below. Are you a big Porsche fan or would you be buying something else? This is a lot of money, but remember it is a limited edition that is only available in Australia. Let me know what you think in the comments section below. Porsche or are you going for some other brand of car and why? So we are inside the GT3. 70th anniversary, the Touring Edition. Um, let's start off with the key. So this is what it looks like. It's in the shape of a car, which I reckon is pretty cool. You got the Porsche logo up the top, unlock, lock, front boot, and then on the back, it's blank. Now this is the body color as well. So Porsche has gone to effort to kind of give it that appearance. You can actually option on, I think every Porsche to get your key in the body color as well. So it's a proximity sensing key. So you leave that in your pocket, grab the door handle. And once you're inside, you have effectively what looks like a key, but it is the starter over here on the right hand side. So let's talk about the design. So this being, uh, I guess, a limited edition, a special car that they've built from scratch. Porsche has designed what they wanted this to look like. So they've used elements like this, which matches the body color. You've got GT3 70 years Porsche Australia edition there. Uh, in addition to that, they've used crayon here on the gear stick with the stitching and also at the 12 o'clock position. This harks back to that first 356 that came to Australia. Then on the dash, I love this material. It looks like alligator skin, the way that they've finished that off. And then they've got that faux suede on the roof there. The seats are pretty special as well. So you've got the Porsche crest up the top there. You've got this tartan material, which kind of also matches uh, what they did with the 356 that came to Australia. This comes standard with the bucket seats. So <laughs> these things really hug you in nicely. Exposed carbon there, slots for your uh, a harness as well should you want to install one so it is a pretty special place to be seated and I'll tell you what the changes they've made to this are really tasteful and yeah they, they just suit the car beautifully so uh, big thumbs up from me on the design here and the elements that they've added to it what about your touch points well in the center here you've got a 70 there this is firm and on the door, it's firm as well. How firm is it? Well, we've got our durometer. We've tested the main surfaces in this cabin. If you want to see how this car compares to other cars that we've tested before, have a look at the link in the description. Now, build quality. It is all nice and solid as we get infested by flies here. And then door sound, let's have a listen. Yeah, that sounds really nice and solid as well. Let's talk about infotainment. So it comes standard with a 10.9 inch infotainment screen. It's actually a really good infotainment system. If you cast your mind back to uh, 911, uh, was it 991, I think, that had the older school infotainment system, this is a really big step forward in terms of what's on offer. It's a higher resolution screen. You've got plenty of fun stuff to play with here, including navigation built into the screen. You have AM, FM, DAB plus digital radio, 12 speaker Bose branded sound system as well that sort of does a pretty good job. Over the air updates too, so you can actually get new features added to the infotainment system. An example of this is they added wireless Apple 
CarPlay to it, so it now does that function without you needing to go back to the dealership and, and doing other bits and pieces. So um, yeah, really, really impressive setup there. This is also where you control some of the drive settings. So I'll go through this in a bit more detail when we do go for a spin, but you do have main functions here and then secondary functions into this screen as well. You can also configure the steering wheel button to do different things too. So really nice infotainment system. Now ahead of the driver, you've got an additional two screens that flank that center display there that has an analog tachometer, but the rest of it is digital. And uh, they've just presented it really nicely. It gives you the key information you need. And again, when we go for a drive, I'll run you through some of the different drive options that change the display on the screen ahead of the driver. And I'm still a huge fan of Sport Chrono. So that adds that uh, stopwatch up the top there that you can control through the steering wheel or the infotainment display as well. Now, this is what Apple CarPlay looks like. So pretty much a full screen integration, nice and sharp and fast as well. Then you have voice recognition here on the steering wheel, which means you just blast a command at it, and then it just does all of the hard work for you. And this is what Android Auto looks like. So again, full screen integration, and pretty sharp and quick as well. Moving on to safety tech, look, this is a bit of a funny one because with safety technology, uh, you know, it's built for cars that are in and around the city carrying family and that kind of thing. Safety tech is actually more of a problem in a vehicle like this because on a racetrack, you don't want the stuff intervening when you're trying to go for a fast lap. So this really just has the basics. So you have autonomous emergency braking. You can get the 911 with a lane departure warning and a lane keeping assistant and things like blind spot monitoring as well. Um, but in terms of the GT3, it is very much about um, just going as fast as you can with, without getting interrupted while you're doing that. On the parking front, you just have rear parking sensors and a reverse view camera. I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, the quality of that is terrible. So it's really low resolution and we've got our suitcase there with the lettering on it. You can read it, which is good, but you can see from that vision that it is pretty low resolution. But you do get your sonar sensors down the bottom there, which is a good thing, I guess. Moving on to practicality, and we'll start with your connectivity. So in here you have two USB-C outlets. You have a little nook there for your phone. So in terms of storing your phone, it can kind of rest in there or it can just live in the center here within that um, nook. Other storage nooks, you've got that little slot there. You've got a little one here just next to the driver. And then you also have your center console here. It's also a glove box as well. Not overly big though, once you've got the manual in there kind of everything squeezes into there. Um, so yeah, obviously I'm not expecting this to have huge storage, but that's what it is. You do have storage behind the seat though. So because this doesn't have two passenger seats behind the driver, you've got plenty of room to put odds and ends in there, bags, perhaps even golf clubs or something like that uh, if they don't fit into the front bonnet. What about your comfort? Well, you have dual zone automatic climate control. That is about it in terms of um, anything else. There's no heated seats or, or anything else to play with there. Um, in terms of the seats themselves, so these are the bucket seats. When you get in, it is a little difficult to get in just because you've got to sit over the lip and then fall into the seat and away you go. It also means they have limited adjustments. So you can move the seat electrically up and down and you can go forwards and backwards manually. But outside of that, the, the bucket is pretty much fixed in that position. So you're not going to have too much flexibility, but the driving position is fantastic and the steering wheel has both tilt and reach adjustments so you can basically set it up exactly how you want to and and look i mean it is literally the perfect driving position i really wouldn't want to change much about it now let's talk cargo because there is no boot back there you store your bags up the front here and there is 132 liters of cargo space it's actually not too bad it's really really deep so it doesn't fit our big suitcase unfortunately you'll see if i try put that in the wheels just get snagged so if you did take the wheels off this would actually slot in there without too many problems but it does fit our laptop bag without too many dramas at all i will call out something cool here under the bonnet this is a carbon plastic composite so to reduce weight, they've uh, developed that material there for the bonnet. And it is, obviously it's on struts here, but you can just tell that this is light as a feather. So pretty cool setup there for the GT3. Okay, so we have hit the road in the GT3. Now it is pretty loud in here, so I'm gonna speak up a little bit because remember, this is a race car for the road. Before we do any faster driving, uh, I'm gonna run you through just the basics of this and how you would live with it as a daily driver. We'll start off with the engine. Four litre, 
six cylinder naturally aspirated so no turbochargers or superchargers here and it produces 375 kilowatts of power and 470 newton meters of torque the other crazy part is the 9000 rpm redline it is just a stupid number because when you think about cars it, it's you're getting into like motorbike territory when you get above that sort of seven, eight thousand RPM mark. So it is cool to see that this revs all the way out there and it will happily do it daily. I mentioned earlier that this engine is shared with Porsche's race car. So you can just imagine that in that race car, this is going to be mercilessly hammered and it will just get up and do it again the next day. So it's a pretty cool setup and it's nice to see that Porsche really has a direct link between their race vehicles and their road cars. Now it's all mated to either a six-speed manual, which is what we've got here in the car, or a seven-speed dual clutch. Now the big difference between them is acceleration. The manual is slightly slower to 100 kilometers an hour than the uh, PDK. Now that's mainly just because of launch control and gear shift. So a PDK will always shift quicker than a human possibly can. But I mean, you're buying a GT3, you need to get a manual because it is a driver's car and this is the gearbox that you want to have. And unlike other 911 models that come with a seven speed, this is only available with the six speed for the manual transmission. Now, what does that gearbox feel like? I reckon I could just sit in the car all day playing with the gearbox. It is so direct. You can really just rifle through those gears. It's a short throw. It's exactly where you expect it to be. And I don't know, it is just the, the perfect position for shifting fast. Then in addition to that, if you do feel like hill towing, that is where you're riding the brake and grabbing the throttle on a downshift to match the gearbox with the drive line, you've got enough spacing there between the brake and the throttle, and the throttle is mounted from the floor, so it sits up like that. You can really just rest your foot over that and grab it as you go. Or alternatively, you can actually set this to blip the throttle on its own. So if I go now from third to second, it's done all of that on its own. I haven't actually touched any of that. So pretty cool setup. So if you do want to be lazy and you want people to think that you're a professional heel tower, you just flick that switch. Or if you do want to drive for yourself, you just do it all yourself. Now, speaking of which, you have other settings available here. You have your sports exhaust. So if I press that, it immediately gets louder. And I'll show you what that sounds like. Drop back to second here. That sound is absolutely unreal. The engine is like right there, and when it revs all the way out there towards the red line, it is just making an incredible sound inside the cabin. It sounds great outside as well, but inside the cabin, it is just filling this entire space with that flat six humming away. It is interesting as well, if you go down in the settings here to the chassis, normally in the 911 you can pick like normal, sport, track. In this instance, it's just sport or track. There's no messing about here, it's either just sport or track. Now over here on the right hand side, you have some other drive settings as well, so you can flick through them with this function on the steering wheel. So you've got your full map display, sport chrono, so I can click on this, hit start, and it starts the timer up the top there, and I'm able to stop, do new laps, and do everything you want to do there. Then in addition to that, you've got your G-meter, so as we're going around corners, it's gonna give you the Gs that you're hitting. You've got a tire pressure monitor, and then the performance meter. So as this revs out, it tells you where your peak performance is, because the second you go past that marker there towards red line, you are losing performance. You may as well be in another gear, so that manages that whole process for you too. So it's a pretty good setup there in terms of what the driver sees. Now I mentioned earlier that if you do head to the racetrack, you can flick around here to track mode. When you go into track mode, everything around the driver display disappears and just gives you your critical information, such as your temperature, your driving range, and then your speed and revs. That is really all you need when you are going in full attack mode. Now, what's the ride like as a daily? Look, I'm not gonna lie, it is pretty firm, but ultimately, if you're buying this, you're going to have to compromise somewhere because a vehicle that's set up like this to do over 300 kilometers an hour, and fun fact, the manual goes slightly faster than the auto. The manual does 320 versus 318 in the auto. Um, but yeah, when you do have it set up like this, you will have compromise. And in this instance, it's low profile tires, firm suspension, it means that as you are do doing your daily run, going over tram tracks and stuff like that, it will bounce around a little bit and then it gets worse as you go into the sportier settings where you're getting uh, a more aggressive steering and suspension tune as well. 
But as a daily, it's pretty easy to drive. The steering's nice and light. The gearbox is very easy to drive. It doesn't have a really heavy clutch or anything too crazy. It really is just a good compromise between hardcore sports car and daily driven road car. Porsche claims a fuel economy of 12.6 litres per 100 k's. I'm not even going to bother showing it to you here because the car was trucked to the proving ground. It can't be driven on a public road. Um, and it's just pointless. I've been fanging it around here and, and it's like 30 litres per 100 k's or something crazy like that. So uh, we're not going to get anything out of actually trying to figure out how much this will use as a daily. It comes standard with four wheel steering. So at low speeds, you're gonna see it invert a little bit to give you a tighter turning circle and at higher speeds, rear wheels turn in the same direction as the front wheels to make it tuck in more and just get the body nice and uh, controlled through a corner. In addition to that, ride height, stiffness of anti-roll bars and camber can be adjusted on both the front and rear axles. So if you do have a preferred setup for the racetrack, that, that stuff can be customized to your needs. But I think for an average driver, you're probably gonna be happy with the setup that it comes out of the factory with. The other thing worth pointing out as well is there is an electronic rear diff lock. It's an interesting car because it has a ton of mechanical grip, and that is thanks to the tyres, the amount of grip and the traction that those Michelin tyres give you. When that becomes unstuck, you're then driving a car with an engine that hangs out the back, and that means that if it does become unstuck, you really gotta be watching your P's and Q's because it will fling around very quickly if you're not exactly watching what you're doing. Now, what's visibility like? So, look, it's not great, but I think that's just because I'm sitting quite low in the seat here. I can't really see down the front there. A bit of an issue because it doesn't have front parking sensors, so you're gonna have to really be careful when you are parking this to make sure that you don't nudge it up against anything. The wing mirrors are big enough so you can clearly see down the sides there with those big hips at the back and visibility out the back is really good too. Look, you've got rear parking sensors and a reverse view camera so it's going to be enough for parking this but yeah, I would be very careful of the wheels and also the front end during low speed driving. Okay, let's flick this over to sport mode. We've got auto blip active. Oh man, the sound is just so good. Now, our tyres are still warming up here but... The noise is absolutely unreal. It is sitting dead flat through corners. Oh man, as the pace picks up as well, it is. I'm finding it hard to concentrate here on driving and also talking at the same time. Uh, yeah, I, I'm genuinely lost for words. This is absolutely unreal. A lot of people will complain, not uh, sort of force induction, no turbocharger. really be that good yeah it, it is just unreal it's such a free-flowing engine and as you roll onto the throttle it just keeps delivering it's so eager to please you can almost just drive it in second and third and it's just going to give you smiles all day long as we roll onto the back straight here oh man absolutely unreal the brakes are incredible too you can just stand on the anchors and it really pulls it up nicely. There's no sort of uh, inconsistency in pedal feel. The steering feels fantastic in sport mode. Look, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know here. <laughs> yeah, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know here, but this thing is absolutely unreal. I am genuinely just lost for words. I think in the hands of like a super capable driver, you can see why this sets incredible Nürburgring lap times. And to think that the GT3 is like two rungs down from stuff like a GT3 RS and a GT2 RS, like, yeah, I'm like trying to catch up my breathing here to talk about this, but yeah, it is unreal. The sound is amazing. The way that it just sticks through corners is cool. It is, I don't know, it is just the ultimate sports car. And the fact that you can get it here in the touring trim means that you can prowl around the streets and then when you do finally hit the track or a freeway on ramp, you just unleash fury on everyone around you. Now let's talk zero to 100. So the official number for the manual is 3.9 seconds. It's 3.4 seconds if you opt for the PDK. Um, so let's give it a crack here. I, I don't want to destroy this car uh, because it's going to the museum. So I'm just going to be a little gentle, but um, yeah, we'll give it a shot anyway and we'll see exactly how it goes.
So, like I said in the video, 911 GT3, I'm not telling you something that you don't already know. This car is absolutely sensational. Just the fact that it exists is pretty cool in an era today where it's all about EVs. This is a naturally aspirated race car for the road. And I love the fact that Australia now has its own version of the GT3. It's like the, the 911 Sandman edition. And it's cool to see that this will exist in a museum where we can all go and check it out down the tracks. So I'll try and get a photo of this <laughs> overseas with me in front of it or something like that. But um, yeah, awesome car. Love the fact that you can still get it in a manual and it is a visceral, just pure driving experience. So can you live with it as a daily? I don't know, I think the lack of front parking sensors would be a bit of a worry and uh, yeah, it's a little bit rough and all that sort of stuff. But if you are genuinely interested in track driving, this is the ultimate daily driver that can be taken directly to the racetrack and then home again, no modifications required. So let me know what you think. Did you enjoy the video? If you did, hit the like button, share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so we can do more fun things like this. In fact, let me know, are there other interesting cars like this that you'd like to see us review? Let me know in the comments section down there. But until next time, take it easy.